Moncton's okay. <laughs> Moncton's lovely. I like small town New Brunswick. It was lovely. I lived in Sackville. Hey, you don't don't diss the magnetic hill. Like that's magnetic you know? hill is special. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, we're live on YouTube now, um, and so I will hand things over to Phil to introduce. Okay, well, I'm just going to let people continue to trickle in for a moment here. Um, so we'll just continue to riff for a few minutes. Never mind, um, I won't I let Phil. The numbers, the numbers are, are clocking up. I see uh, here, basically one a second or so. Hello, St. Yeah. John's, and London, another another Nobleton, Ancaster, Cochrane, Alberta. Oh, we have a Yukoner in Montreal. That's nice. Nice. Oh, <laughs> Excellent. I have uh, been to. Um, Quebec generally in Montreal specifically only once um, and I remember being part of organizing a public talk there and talking to somebody from McGill about holding a public talk at UDM and she's like gosh you know it's going to be really hard to get people over the mountain and so I fly in and I'm like <laughs> where's the mountain <laughs> yeah, I was uh, shocked that there are bus routes running over the mountain. I'm like, okay. My, my favorite story relating to the mountain, mountain. in Montreal is, is when they went through the, the post um, uh, uh, René Lévesque uh, uh, sort of re Francophonization of Montreal and all the street names got changed and such. Um, they, they renamed Mountain Street Rue de la Montagne, which is, you know, would, would seem to make sense. Except that it wasn't named for the mountain. It wasn't named for Mount Royal. It was named for Bishop Mountain, an actual person. <laughs> with that name. And so, and so we don't normally change people's names when we, when we change language. So anyway. Oopsie. Um, oh, we did, well. We did, have a, we did have, a by the way, an open invitation extended to you, Krista, uh, by, uh, by the uh, Montrealers on, on behalf of, uh, or Kareem on behalf of the Montrealers said, anytime you want to come and visit, he said so. Very good. <laughs> People from Tor Toronto, Kelowna. I don't know how it is across the rest of the country. It is, of course, extraordinarily hot here in Toronto right it's now. We're, we're how is it in happy. the Yukon, Krista? Um, warm. Mm -hmm. It's like 20 degrees outside right now. I'm yes. excited. Um, and it just doesn't get dark, really. Yeah, that's true. Do you get to, like, I guess you just can't do astronomy in the, in the summertime, eh? You get really fond of solar observing. I would bet, yeah. <laughs> the sun is super fascinating. Like, <laughs> cloudy gray and hot in Montreal, says Kareem. Yes. Um, and I guess, yeah, I guess, it, I mean, the sun's, if the sun's up, you might as well observe it. That's right. Yeah. Um, you can do it anytime. <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite. The White Horse is not um, above the Arctic Circle, so we but, don't get yeah. to the 24 hour. Fun, yeah. um, you can't get up at 2.30 in the morning and observe. Well, 2.30 might be. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, I can't remember exactly when sunset and sunrise times here are, because they're just so early or so late as to kind be of irrelevant. irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When for, the furthest, I, I want to come to the Yukon. I haven't been, been, it's one of the places I haven't been to in Canada yet. Uh, furthest north I've been is um, uh, Yellowknife. And I've spent mm. summer, summer in Yellowknife. And yeah, it's just, it's just unreal. It never gets dark. It's the just, Yellowknife you know, might be farther north, actually. Really? Than, than, than Whitehorse? Whitehorse? White Horse is not very far um, from the BC border. Okay. We're 60 degrees in a bit. Um, uh, Yellow, Yellowknife's not that far up into the territories either, but, uh, but yeah, yeah no, I would say, I'd, have, yeah. I'd have to look at the map again. Yeah, so any, anyone who can resolve this for us while we're waiting for a <laughs> uh, 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 to come in, we've got I, a I, whole room full of nerdy people here with internet connections who can look this who up. Who care about us. latitudes as well. No knife like is north of Great Slave Lake. I would say that then it's further north than... Yeah, than, it must yes, be. Yes, it is, it is north of Great Slave Lake. <laughs> so when, when I was, um, I think I was about 12, I came up to the Yukon with my parents and my I loved it. I thought it was fantastic and there were beautiful rivers and all sorts of lovely outdoor stuff. But my dad, we went to Dawson City, and my dad was so angry the whole time because the sidewalks were made of wood and people would skateboard at three in the morning. <laughs> and so you'd hear this like, <laughs> yeah. that said, if you made them out of concrete, it would not be any better. You're right. It's true. They yeah. just break up, yeah. uh, like as the permafrost like heaved up yeah. and down. Um, yeah, it very quickly would not make a difference. No, it, it wouldn't. He, he was, he's not, he's not one for any outside noise. Um, and, and so regardless of concrete, I thought the, the wooden sidewalks were actually quite neat. I wasn't used to seeing them. Um, yeah. And that makes sense with the permafrost and things shifting. Very cool. We are now six minutes after seven. And All right, so I'm going to get us started. <laughs>
So hello, everybody. Welcome. If you've, if you've come here to hear a talk about the loony moons of the solar system, you've come to the right place. If you come to this uh, uh, Zoom session for any other reason, you're probably in the wrong place, but, but stick around anyway, because it, you know, it might be fun and you might learn something. Um, my name is Phil Groff. I'm the executive director here of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. It's my great uh, honor to be able to introduce this first of our second uh, sequence of special speakers series uh, brought to you by the uh, corona pandemic. And, uh, and so we, we took a little bit of a hiatus there for the month of June, but now we're back and we're very excited that the, the first of the speakers for this new series is none other than the, um, Dr. Uh, Herr Professor uh, uh, Christa van Leerhoven. I want to get as many titles in there as I can. Um, many, many of you have already heard of her. She's, she's uh, from the Yukon Center, um, and she'll probably speak about that uh, for a few, a few moments. But she's also working right now through UBC to get her teacher's uh, 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 certificate. So I'll, uh, I'll let her talk about either or both of those further if she wishes to, but I know what she really wants to talk to us about are all those crazy little moonlets and moons in the solar system. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Van Leerhoven. Krista. Thank you, Phil. Um, so yes, I, I will start talking about moons shortly, but first let me preview the Yukon Center to those of you who haven't been here. Um, we're a fairly small center and also uh, fairly new, uh, but our main glory thing is that we've got an observatory. Um, it's north of town, about, um, about 30 minutes north of town. It's uh, about yay big. Um, reflector. I can't, yeah, I was going to look up exactly how big it was, but uh, then I forgot. So <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, a, it's reasonable. Um, and it's got a, a little dome and we've got a warm up shed because it's cold here in the winter. Um, but yeah, we're a really awesome center, super friendly. So if you ever do come up, um, feel free to, oh, Aldo, who's also from the Yukon, Huzzah! Um, he says that it's an 11 inch, which is about yay big, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, we're super awesome and uh, you should totally come visit us once the corona pandemic is like over and stuff. Because uh, at the moment, if you're not from BC or the other territories, you have to isolate for 14 days, just you know, so you know. Um, but uh, anyway, let's now talk about moons. So let me share my screen. I will just, just straight up share my screen and then I need my tuck and I need the zoom thingamajiggies to go away. Don't go peeking for my, <laughs> for my next. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So moons, um, moons are really awesome. And one of the things that I find when talking to people about astronomy is that they tend to concentrate on planets or if they're not gonna concentrate on planets or the solar system, they concentrate on like um, more galactic or extra galactic things. So I want to highlight moons. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about moons of the giant planets um, uh, because they're super interesting, but nobody really talks about them very much. So let's get started. The moons of the giant planets are hugely varied and we'll get into um, what some of that variation looks like, um, but things like the number of moons, how large they are, if there's a collection of different sizes or if they're all fairly similarly sized, that sort of thing is really, really variable um, among the giant planets. I should note that the terrestrial moons like our Earth, um, the moons of Mars, um, and also uh, moons of asteroids or Kuiper Belt objects. Um, these are also super interesting, but I'm not going to get a chance to talk about them. You should invite me back um, to talk about those. <laughs> I suppose if we have to. <laughs> uh, but maybe after my teaching degree is done, because I haven't made that talk yet. So hey. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so let's get started. And we'll go from um, Jupiter out through to Neptune and talk about these systems. And then I'll sum up a little bit about the general similarities and differences. One thing I should note before I really get going is that there's two main populations of moons. There's 
regular moons, which probably formed around the planet as that planet was forming, very similarly to how the planets formed around the sun when the sun was forming. But there's also a collection of other things um, called irregular moons. And these are things that were captured later, um, usually um, through some interaction with the planet or other moons, um, or um, it might have come in as a, as a pair and one of them um, went back out into the solar system and one of them got captured around the planet. Those of you who know things about orbits know that if you don't uh, change the orbit of the moon as it's going by the, uh, the planet, then it will slingshot on through and keep going. So you do need something to, to keep it captured around um, the planet, um, but that can happen. And so each of the giant planets has a host of things that are orbiting around it in a kind of a cloud every which way. Uh, and these are the irregular moons that came along later. Through most of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the regular moons, which mostly orbit in the uh, in the equator plane of the planet, more or less, um, and would have formed with the planet. But there's an important exception that we'll get to later. Let's start with Jupiter's moons. So Jupiter's got four big moons. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And this is them just approximately to scale with uh, the Great Red Spot. The innermost moon, Io, the really interesting thing about this is that it is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. It has lots of volcanoes. Essentially, every little pockmark that you can see on this surface, that is a volcano or a lava lake. Um, which is associated with the volcano. Um, of all of the things that exist in the solar system, only Earth and Io have lava lakes. <laughs> Earth's got two, uh, one in Hawaii and uh, one in Ethiopia, I believe. Um, Io's got a, a, another handful um, and a whole bunch of other volcanoes besides. Um, the yellow color is from sulfur, which is also volcanically um, interactive, that the, the sulfur comes from the volcanoes. Um, and to put into perspective how volcanically active Io is, if you look at the amount of heat coming from the surface, uh, on Earth you get 0 0.08 watts per meter squared. So if you take any given meter squared um, on Earth's surface, on average, you'll have 0 0.08 watts um, radiating from, surface from geothermal heat. On Io, that number is two, two watts per meter squared. So 0 0.08 versus two, very volcanically active, um, super, super volcanically active. But why? Like if you just plunk a moon down at random, where is the heat coming from? It all has to do with tides. Now tides do two main things. Um, the first is that they lock, um, one face towards the planet. So this is like our moon. We only ever see really one face, uh, a little bit of um, eccentricity wobble aside. Um, so if you stamped a smiley face on the top of, of any moon, the face would always be this, the same orientation relative to the planet. So here I've got the bottom of the smile always pointed towards the planet. And that is something that results directly from tides. Basically, because tides depend on distance, you'll elongate your body. If it's got some rotation, that bulge will be out of line with the planet, and then gravity can torque on that bulge to try to bring the bulge back into line. Um, lots and lots of time later and lots and lots of, of torquing, you end up locked so that your, your tidal bulge does always face the planet. So that's the first thing the tides does. Um, another thing that tides do is they tend to circularize orbits. Um, but when you're along the way, so say you've got an orbit that's a little bit, a, a little bit elongated, a little bit eccentric, if you'll let me use that jargon, um, then sometimes your planet is, your moon is closer to the planet, and sometimes it's a little further away. And because um, because gravity depends on distance, when you're closer to your planet, 
um, the tidal bulge, and that results also from gravity being dependent on distance, that the near side of the moon is tugged more strongly towards the planet than the far side of the moon. Um, when you're close to the planet, that difference, that bulge is bigger. If you're farther from the planet, that bulge is smaller. And so if you've got an orbit where your distance from the planet varies, then you're going to get squished, kind of like a stress ball, um, and you go squishy, 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 squishy. One of the things you'll notice is that that ball, that stress ball, um, will warm up. Um, and this is a friction thing. Basically, as you're sliding parts of the moon against each other, you'll um, invoke friction um, as things scrape against each other, and you'll heat up the moon. This is Io's source um, of heat, of, of energy. Um, because this is uh, an energy drain, um, the orbits should eventually become circular. But in the case of Io, it doesn't for another reason. Uh, but let's first take another um, quick glance at Io's volcanoes. Um, so here on the left, we have Io in the infrared, where if it's bright, it's hot. And on the right, we have a, a visible uh, wavelength image of Io, where here we've turned up the contrast so that you can see the plume um, at the top, very slightly left. Um, and that is a, a volcanic plume. Um, so these tides, this squishy, squishy, squishy from being closer and farther from the from the planet, I can see Jenna laughing because I muted myself so that you can't hear me laugh. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's you know, hey, you, um, just because an explanation makes you laugh does not make it a bad explanation. It makes it a good good one. I think I'm gonna remember um, the squishy squishy more than anything. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so Io here from tides, but very volcanically active. So why doesn't its orbit become circular? That has to do with interaction with the other moons. So Io moves around in a certain amount of time. Europa takes almost exactly twice as long and Ganymede takes almost exactly four times as long. If you watch this GIF I've got, uh, you'll realize that this has the moons passing each other at fairly consistent locations. They get closest to each other at particular points along the orbit. Um, this is like setting, this is, this is setting up something where you get repeated coherent kicks. So if you imagine somebody on a swing set, if you push them at the same phase, the same part of their swing uh, every time, then you'll build up how high they're swinging. This is normally how you would interact with somebody on a swing set. However, if you push them at random times in their swing, you'd end up with a very annoyed person on a swing set, um, but you wouldn't end up with them having a high swing um, because all the kicks that you're giving, the pushes you're giving them would kind of cancel each other out. Um, so here um, in this situation that Io's got going on, we've got the, the phased um, coherent kicks situation. And that this is what keeps Io's orbit from becoming very, very circular, where this tidal heat would shut off. This tidal heating is also relevant for uh, Europa and for Ganymede. Um, Callisto, you'll notice, is not involved um, with this um, orbital dance. This is called resonance. Um, just in case I, I use that jargon term later, because I try to avoid jargon, but sometimes I can't help myself. So this is called resonance. So Europa um, also gets um, some amount of heat and tidal heat, but because it's farther from the planet, uh, it gets correspondingly less heat. Uh, and this will become important as we um, go through these, uh, these moons. So it orbits Jupiter every uh, about three and a half days. It's the smallest of these four large moons, and it has a very young surface of water ice. The reason that we can tell it's young is because there aren't very many craters. So if a moon or a planet or something like that just exists out in the solar system, then it gets hit by stuff occasionally. 
And over time, that will build up craters. So if you've got lots of craters covering all of the surface, you know it's been hanging out there for a while and nothing's rewritten the surface besides it being hit by stuff. If you've got a surface without craters, you know that something else needs to be going on so that the surface rewrites itself. You basically take an eraser to a, to a chalkboard. Um, on Earth, we've got um, plate tectonics, which continually renews our surface um, and the associated volcanoes. Uh, we've also got erosion um, from wind and water. Uh, on Europa, we think it's uh, probably um, that the surface um, does some melt through related things every once in a while. Um, and also these ridges um, that exist on Europa's surface are constantly um, constantly working, um, forming, uh, let's, you know, let's go through a, a close up um, of these ridges. Um, Ridges, we think they form because as Europa goes around Jupiter and it gets tidally flexed, um, it stresses the surface. So in some ways you've got, uh, the, the ridge would be more open, in some ways it would be more closed on depending on where around the orbit you are. Um, so these um, are basically are cracks that are continually opening and shutting. And when they shut, we think they force some material up um, as you, you know, basically imagine a straw and you squish it in the middle um, and, and move it along, you'll get a little bit of water spreading out the bottom and over the top. Um, so that's where you get this built up ridge like structure. Um, as that um, continues, you can basically, you can rework the surface and as these ridges keep um, building up in slightly different locations as the surface um, conditions of Europa change uh, very slowly over time, um, you'll end up rewriting a lot of the surface just by building ridges. Uh, this here is an example of a melt through related thing that we think went on. Um, this is something called chaos terrain. And it, if you use your imagination here, you can look at all these different pieces. And if you're a person who does puzzles like me, love me some puzzles, then you're, you're kind of tempted to there, there are some newer features that are overwriting, but um, you can take these large chunks and go, well, you know, that ridge looks really similar to that ridge. And you could like imagine just shuffling that, that back and connecting them up. It looks like what you did was take a hammer to this, um, this surface, broke it up into shards and those shards kind of floated away a little bit on some background slushiness. And that is more or less what we think happened um, that the surface got slushy, um, that we had some heat transfer to close to the surface, probably something um, like hot spots on, on Earth, though don't get too invested in that analogy because we don't really understand how this works. Um, and the surface um, more or less melted, not completely melted, so you wouldn't have had open water, um, but you would have had something much more akin to slush. Um, and these pieces broke up and rafted apart from each other. Um, so th this is how we think a lot of the rewriting happens uh, on Europa. Uh, it does have a few craters, um, <clears throat> but between ridge building and this chaos terrain, uh, Europa seems to do a very good job of rewriting its surface um, quite regularly. Next up, Ganymede. Ganymede, one of my favorite moons, if I you know, had to choose a favorite. Um, and this is the largest moon in the solar system. This is larger even than Mercury. And really the only reason it's not a planet is because it's orbiting Jupiter and it's not orbiting the sun. Um, that said, it is less massive than Mercury. This is a composition difference. If you've got something um, icy, it will be less dense um, than something that is mostly rocky. Um, so Ganymede is larger than Mercury, but it is less massive. Um, so it orbits in about uh, seven days. And you'll notice on its surface too, there are some craters, more than there were on Europa, um, but its surface also looks like somebody's fiddled with it. It's not like the moon or like Mercury, um, where you basically got an expanse of craters and nothing else. Um, 
but don't tell anybody who studies the moon or mercury that I just said that because uh, they get mad. <laughs> um, there, there is something that's doing some reworking of, of Ganymede's surface. And so here, again, we have some amount of heat that Ganymede's get, Ganymede is getting from tidal heating. But because it's farther away even than Europa, it's getting less heat. So on Io, we saw lots of volcanoes. On Europa, we saw reworking of its surface. Um, and uh, I should have mentioned, I can't believe I talked about Europa and I didn't mention this. It's got a subsurface ocean. Um, <laughs> silly me. Um, yeah. A anyway, um, and that the the thing that keeps that liquid is um, is the tidal heat. Um, on Ganymede, um, here we have some reworking of the surface. Ganymede also, interestingly, we think, has a subsurface ocean, but it's way deeper. Uh, Ganymede is the only moon um, that we believe has an intrinsic magnetic field. So um, of all of the planets, um, let's see, Mercury, Earth, um, all of the giant and all of the giant planets have an intrinsic magnetic field. So that leaves out Venus, in case you were trying to, to mentally do that uh, that math. Um, uh, oh, and Mars. Um, Venus and Mars do not have global magnetic fields, um, but uh, all the rest of the planets do. Moons don't, as far as we know. Generally, um, that said, we haven't flown magnetometers by all of them. Um, but Ganymede, we know, does have an intrinsic magnetic field, um, just like Earth does. On Earth, we think it's currents in the outer core, which is mostly liquid iron. On Ganymede, we think it's currents in a subsurface, very briny um, ocean. Um, so that's really cool. So Ganymede's doing super interesting stuff as well with its little portion of tidal heat. In contrast, Callisto, this this is where we finally get to something that like actually looks like it's just been cratered and that's it. Um, and that's more or less the story of Callisto, but don't let anybody tell you Callisto's boring because Callisto is very, very similar in size to Ganymede. And it's really the fact that it's not involved in this orbital resonance dance that means that it, it doesn't get any tidal heat. Um, so where Ganymede has had enough heat so that it has, um, has become layered, the heavier rock has sunk more to the core, it's got a, a little bit of a subsurface ocean, it's got more icy stuff on top. Um, Callisto, the rock and the ice is still all mixed together. Um, it's what we call undifferentiated. Um, basically the, the, the layers have not separated out by density. You need a certain amount of heat to get you to that. Um, so Ga Callisto is really, uh, really instructive at a contrast um, to Ganymede. So if you look at all of the Galilean moons together, um, Io has scared off all of its, all of whatever water it started with um, because it's, um, tidal heat and volcanoes. Um, Europa has differentiated, so it's got a rocky core, um, pro well, probably a probably an iron core, um, and then a rocky mantle, um, and then a surface of ice. And this is where some of the interesting stuff happens with the, with the liquid ocean and, um, and the shell of ice that rewrites itself. Um, Ganymede also is layered. It's had enough tidal heating to uh, break itself up into, into layers, but Callisto hasn't. And if you go along this, you'll notice that I was the most dense, Europa is next, then Ganymede, and then Callisto. Um, and this really is a culmination of the story that involves um, the orbital resonance dance um, and tidal heat. So yeah. While you're on that slide, there is a question from, I think, Swapnet. Yep, Swapnet. Um, what is the composition of Europa's ocean? So Europa's ocean um, is also briny, so salty. Um, beyond that, it's hard to speculate. Um, 
we don't have any any samples of Europa's ocean. Um, the reason I, I highlighted that Ganymede's ocean um, was briny is because you need ions. So if you dissolve salt in water, you'll have like the, the sodium and the chlorine, for example, dissociate from each other. Um, and so you'll get ions wandering around in the water. So that's why it's really important that um, Ganymede's ocean is briny. Um, with Europa, it's probably also some measure of briny, but we don't have a good measure of that. Uh, recent, um, recent telescopic observations have suggested that Europa has plumes, um, similar to Enceladus, which I'll get to next. Okay. Um, <laughs> just did like a little preview, um, but we haven't sampled them yet. Uh, we don't know really um, what their composition is, but that would be something that would give us a better handle on um, what is in the ocean. It's mostly water, but like, what else? Maybe life, who knows? <laughs> Just, you know, don't get too excited that the next mission will find it. Um, uh, yeah. We get a little excited. <laughs> well, you know, a little. I mean, I love getting excited about missions generally, um, but when I talk about Saturn, I'll talk about the next mission that I'm really excited for. Okay. So let's move on to Saturn. So Saturn, um, has a similar story going on for some of its moons. We've got Enceladus and Dione, and these two moons are also involved in a resonance dance. And that's important particularly for Enceladus. So this is Enceladus, it's um, cratered more on the, on the Northern hemisphere and um, the Southern hemisphere has these things called the tiger stripes, uh, which basically looks like a cat went Meow! Um, and swiped to Europa at uh, Enceladus. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I think that's actually where the name came from. Um, I know. Um, and these tiger stripes are interesting. If you um, say flew a spacecraft named Cassini by Saturn, and you looked at these tiger stripes um, in the infrared, which they totally did, um, then you'll notice that the, <laughs> the southern hemisphere um, is a lot warmer and the the warmer um, like actually really specifically concentrates not it's not diffused the whole southern hemisphere it's very concentrated in these tiger stripes and um, you could also say with this same spacecraft notice that Enceladus has plumes um, so as Enceladus's surface is reworked through tides um, we get some plumes that emanate from the surface. Uh, and Cassini has flown through these and they're mostly water um, with some other trace um, things, which I totally, don't ask me because I totally can't actually remember what the trace things are. Um, for the longest time, the main debate about the composition of Enceladus's plumes uh, related to whether or not the ocean uh, that these we think originate with in, underneath Enceladus, um, whether that ocean is global, um, extends um, all around Enceladus, or whether it's local, located just under the southern hemisphere. Um, because this dichotomy, the craters on top, tiger stripes on the bottom, is really striking. Um, latest calculations I've heard suggest that the ocean is global, um, but the surface, the overlaying surface ice is thinner on the South Pole. Um, and you would expect thinnesses in the crust to migrate either to the South Pole or the North Pole for reasons that I'm totally not going to explain. Um, <laughs> let's just avoid that. Um, but yeah, um, so th this, is, this is also a story of, of tides um, and resonance. Because I can't talk about Saturn's moons without talking about Titan, here it is. Um, uh, Titan is the largest of Saturn's moons. Saturn, the, the Saturn system generally is one large moon, Titan, and a whole host of medium-sized moons. Um, and Titan has a really thick atmosphere. This is Titan's like main claim to fame. Some of the other moons have very tenuous atmospheres, um, but Titan really actually has a, a really thick atmosphere. In fact, the density of the atmosphere at the surface of Titan, something like one and a half times the density of Earth's atmosphere. Um, if you know you could make yourself a spacesuit where you could be comfortable at 
um, a very cold temperature, which Titan's surface is, um, and you strapped wings to yourself as a human, you in principle could fly um, in, in Titan's atmosphere. That's how dense it is. Um, but again, other things to mitigate like breathing and temperature. Um, Whatever, minor, minor, super minor things. You know, like <laughs> as like, if we're bringing a human to Titan, we probably figured that out. So <laughs> huh. anyway, um, yeah, so Titan's really interesting. Um, and its atmosphere is opaque, which means that we can't see through it, um, at least not at visible wavelengths. Um, if you um, go over Titan, say, with a spacecraft named Cassini um, and use radar, then you can penetrate through the surface. And here, the dark areas are smooth and the bright areas are rough. Um, and these smooth areas, we think, are lakes um, of methane. And the, the way that Titan's atmosphere becomes opaque is that the methane in Titan's atmosphere undergoes photochemistry, basically chemistry due to light. Um, you get light from the sun, comes in, and one of the hydrogen goes, ah, and light pops off. Um, you find, uh, you know, one of those and another one of those, and you stick to them together, and suddenly you've got ethane. Um, you do this a whole bunch, and you can uh, build up to larger and larger and larger things. Um, so for those of you who don't remember, um, methane is one carbon with four hydrogens um, around. Ethane has two carbons with hydrogen around, um, and you can build up to longer and longer and longer chains um, of carbons. And that makes a haze, and the haze means that Titan's atmosphere is opaque. So um, you can, and we have, um, flown into the atmosphere of Titan. This is an image from the Huygens probe which was dropped from Cassini. And this is one of the a mosaic of images that it took on its way down. Um, and one of the interesting things that you'll, you'll see when you look at it is if you, if you looked at this image and you said, gosh, that looks like a stream bed, you know, where the smaller streams connect to make bigger streams and so on and so forth and, until you make a river, that is exactly actually what's going on here. And the real big difference between how that works on Earth and how that works on Titan is that on Titan, the liquid is methane because at the temperature and pressure that we're talking about with Titan, um, methane can be a gas in the atmosphere um, or it can be a liquid um, running along the surface or um, in lakes. So this is erosion um, on, on Titan um, from liquid um, methane. Um, so Titan is, is the only other body that we know of that has a cycle similar to Earth's water cycle. Um, so here on Earth, we can have water be liquid or we can have it be gaseous in the atmosphere or we can have it be frozen like it is most of the time here in the Yukon. <clears throat> um, but it can exist in all, in all states. Um, Titan is similar, but it's got methane as the liquid. And interestingly, water is the bedrock here. Um, so this, the surface, like the rocks, um, are water, um, and the liquid is methane. And uh, we end up with the, because we landed on the surface, um, I can make this wonderful picture where we look at the surface of, of Titan and we can compare it to other surfaces like that of, of the moon here to give you a sense of scale. And you can look at these rocks and go, gosh, they look kind of like rocks that would be rounded that you'd find beside a river. And again, you'd be right. Um, but here the rocks are made of water and the liquid was methane uh, that tumbled them down this stream. I'd like, um, so cool. I know. Um, absolutely fantastic. And really, um, you could spend a whole hour talking uh, about Titan. Um, but the, the thing to remember before we leave Titan is that there is going to be a mission to Titan called Dragonfly, where they are going to take a quadcopter and land it on Titan. And then, you know, they'll take measurements for a while and let the batteries recharge. And then they'll like, hop over to somewhere else and take some more measurements and some more pictures and stuff. I am really looking forward to this. This is going to be so cool. It will be a quadcopter on Titan. I haven't um, heard of this before. I'm so excited. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely awesome. It's still, um, still in development and building. Um, and normally with NASA, they start really publicizing their missions when they launch um, because 
Well, I think there's some superstition that if you start advertising things before they launch, it will end up blowing up on the launch pad. So, you know, yeah. fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Titan, super cool. That mission was Dragonfly again, right? Yes, Dragonfly. Okay. All right. And before we leave um, Saturn, I should also talk about um, Iapetus. So Iapetus is really cool because on one side it is dark, like really dark. And on one side it's light, like really light. How am I doing for time? Terribly. Um, it's fun. It's all good. This is super interesting and entertaining. <laughs> I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, one side's dark and one side is light. Uh, and you might go, uh, hmm, uh, what is going on here? What's going on here, we think, involves another moon called um, where um, meteorites um, impact Phoebe and knock off small pieces of Phoebe into inter-Saturnian space. Um, some of those pieces would hit Iapetus, and those pieces are um, pretty dark. Um, and I Iapetus, because it is tidally locked, it's got one face always facing Saturn, um, it sweeps through things in a with a particular geometry. So the leading side here is the dark side as it smacks into, into dust and picks it up. And the bright side is really what Iapetus would have been without the interference of this other moon, Phoebe. Um, that said, this, um, this difference, this dichotomy is also exacerbated by thermal problems, the thermal considerations, where if you're dark, it will be warmer. And if you've got ice, it will um, sublimate. It will go from ice to gas. Um, and then when it settles, it, it, if it settles somewhere bright, then it won't resublimate again. It will stay locked there as ice because the brighter parts are cooler, uh, more reflective. Um, so if you start a little bit dark on one side and a little bit light on the other, um, then these thermal considerations will drive you um, to an extreme. Um, so the original darkening was probably related to Phoebe, though it could have been other um, moons there in the, in the past. Um, uh, but this, the really stark difference was then exacerbated by this thermal uh, feedback. So that's Iapetus, just because I can't, I can't talk about Saturn without talking about Iapetus. You just can't do it. You're not allowed. Um, anyway, so that's, that's the rules. Uh, we don't make the rules. The, yeah. Um, another, you know, the main thing that people think about when they think about Saturn is the rings. And there are some moons um, in and among Saturn's rings. There are also rings around Jupiter and there are moons in Jupiter's rings, but I didn't talk about them in the interests of time. Um, but we'll see that rings uh, and moons in these rings is actually, a, a, it's really common um, for our giant planets. Um, these moons can ha be really interesting. They drive structure in the rings. So here we've got a scallop shape um, from the gravity of this little moon interacting with the rings. Um, you could also get vertical structures if the moon is not quite in the same plane as the rings. Um, these, these structures are, these vertical structures, uh, like here, this, the rings are lit almost edge on, so you can see the shadow of the, of the vertical structure on the main ring plane. Um, these structures are a kilometer or so high, um, which is kind of a big deal when um, the, the thickness of the ring typically is measured in meters. Um, like tens of meters at most. Um, so yeah, the, these moons can have a, a really big impact um, on the rings. Um, it can also have a, an interesting effect on the moon. So this is the moon Pan, which looks a little bit like ravioli and makes me forget that I didn't really have lunch. Um, uh, here you have this core moonlit, and then it's got this little tutu on it um, that is collected ring particles. Um, as it has interacted with the rings, mostly it's thrown the ring particles around, but every once in a while it collects them and it sticks to the side. Um, and that's where we think this kind of ravioli um, shape 
um, comes from. All right. But uh, continue along um, with the, the rings and moons um, theme that we're, we've got going on, I'm going to talk about Uranus. Giggle now, <laughs> because I'm not going to pronounce it the other way. <laughs> Uranus, all right? Um, so Uranus, um, also super interesting. Now Uranus has five moons of a pro of medium sort of size, um, but I'm not really going to talk about them. Um, you can see from these pictures, this is approximately true color, um, that there's a huge variety um, among these moons. Umbriel's super dark, Titanium and Oberon are much brighter, Oberon's a little reddish. Um, you can see some interesting surface features, um, but these moons, we don't know a really whole bunch about them because they've only ever been flown by, by Jupiter. Um, goodness, by Voyager, which rhymes, which is probably where that came from. Um, but Voyager 2 is the only spacecraft that we've sent um, to, to Uranus and Neptune. And so we have some hints that there, there are, there must be dramas going on with, with these five medium-sized moons. Um, but it's really hard to figure out what those dramas are um, because these are really the best images that we have. Um, so I'm going to skip talking about these and talking about um, the moons that are more in and among Uranus's rings because I, so my background is I study mostly orbital shenanigans and there's orbital shenanigans going on here. So uh, yeah. Um, so these moons are named Cordelia, Ophelia, Bianca, Cressida, Desdemona, Juliet, Portia, Rosalind, Cupid, Belinda, Perdita, Puck, and Mob. And if you feel like you're being haunted by your high school English teacher, you are correct. <laughs> um, because these names are derived from Shakespeare plays. When the, the five medium moons, they were discovered first because they're bigger and brighter. Um, they were named after fairies, um, both from Shakespeare and from a, po a poem by Alexander Pope. Um, and when they found more moons, they went with the Shakespeare theme and kind of left the fairy theme um, behind. There's only so many fairies, I guess, and there's more Shakespeare characters. Um, <clears throat> but here we are, and um, I swear to you that this is a Shakespeare drama in space. <laughs> so these moons are, um, are quite close together. And so they will interact with each other gravitationally and shove each other around a little bit. And that's important. The other thing to note here is that there are rings, um, and I will talk a bit about the influence of these things, uh, these rings later, um, but for the, for the moment, tuck this in the back of your brain and just remember that they're there. These moons are really close together. So Cupid and Belinda, for example, are separated by 460 kilometers. And so if you think about, say, Canada, um, then if you were traveling from Vancouver to, I think it was about Nelson, um, that's kind of the right scale. I think, um, what was the one that I had in the East? Toronto to Montreal, maybe? Uh, as the crow flies better. is somewhere around 500 kilometers. Um, so these, like, they're ridiculously close together. Um, and as they interact, they, they shuffle each other around a little bit. So if you give um, our best knowledge of the orbits of these moons to a computer and you say, dear computer, I think these are the masses of these things and I think this is the velocity of these things and this is how gravity works. Could you please you know, step forward in time and tell me what these moons do um, into the future? Dear computer, do gravity. Um, if, you, if you do that, then uh, the result of, of your um, gravitational simulations, they're called, is that um, Cupid and Belinda's orbits are very likely to cross. Um, 
And because we only know the orbits of these so well, you can do a whole bunch of different um, scenarios where you have slightly different velocities or slightly different masses um, for any of these moons. Um, and when you, you sample over that variety, sometimes it's Cressida and Desdemona, which is the next closest pair um, that end up crossing first. Uh, but in any case, the system's unstable. Um, the way that we're seeing it right now is not the way that it's going to be forever into the future. Um, and this is a pretty big deal. Like we assume that when we see a system, planetary or otherwise, we assume that we're not seeing it at a special time. But here we are, and apparently we are viewing this system very shortly before it will be different uh, from how we see it now. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, for reference, the age of the solar system is about four and a half billion years. Um, and the like likely crossing time of the orbits of Jupiter and Belinda is about 100,000 years. Um, so there are several orders of magnitude there that like separate these things. Um, this is, this is something that is still um, being fairly actively worked on um, in, in the community. Uh, we're waiting for computers to get much better so that we can, we can do um, better simulations. And one of the main reasons that we're waiting for better computers is because there are these things. So doing these simulations, if you've just got you know, some mass and they've got some orbits and the only thing that's going on is gravity, that's fine. You can, you can do that pretty okay. Um, now with rings, rings is, including rings in these calculations is, is somewhere between like, please no and ah, why, ah. So, um, the algorithms that are required to really robustly include the influence of these rings um, gravitationally, like you can imagine dividing a ring into like a certain number of, of particles. Um, but unless you have a, a very large number of particles per ring, you don't represent their gravitational influence really well. Um, and that just sucks up your computer time, like wow. Um, so this is a hard problem. Um, and one of the reasons why I won't claim that I know for sure that Cupid and Belinda are going to um, have their orbits cross. But it made for a wonderful series of papers that were entitled Cupid is Doomed, um, which is I think the best um, title for a, for a planetary science paper I've ever seen. Um, but yeah, here with, with Uranus, the, the main drama that this system has going on is this orbital drama um, with these inner moons that are in and among the Uranian rings. So Neptune. Before, hold on one second. There's one quick question before we move on to Neptune. Does or Uranus's tilt make any difference? Do you know? Not really, not strongly, not this close to the planet. Um, it can matter, um, but um, so these are, are all orbiting in approximately the, the equatorial plane. Um, the, the, like if you took um, Uranus's equator and like whew, um, made it out into a plane, um, that's the equatorial plane. Um, so these moons are all, all, are all orbiting in that plane. And that's the favored plane because Uranus is bulged a little bit because it's spinning. And you know, you remember when you're like whipping around like your child or your younger brother, um, if, you're, if you're going around in circles, then their fleet fly away from them, right? That's mm -hmm. how this works. Um, Uranus is also rotating, so it's middle bulges, um, bulges away from the center of the planet a little bit, and that creates an asymmetry. Um, so close to the planet, that is the main influence. Um, if you were very far from the planet, um, then things would tend to um, orbit in the, in the plane of the solar system um, defined by the sun. Um, but here close to the planet, it's the equatorial plane. That is, that is the plane that matters. Um, if you really want to go down a rabbit hole, look up something called the Laplace plane. Um, because that is the, that's the physics that's um, going on here. Um, 
but I don't recommend it. <laughs> Unless you want to be subjected to a whole bunch of talk about momentum, so particularly angular momentum. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, but yeah, the, 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 basically the symmetry plane, the preferred plane, um, that's called the Laplace. Um, and close to the planet, it will be the equatorial plane. Okay, good to move on to Neptune. There is one more Uranus question on, on our Q&A thing here. Uh, from okay, sorry. It's, why are there three separate, and of course there's more than three rings, but why are there kind of three clusters of rings? Does that have to do with the moons being in the interspersed inter side? Probably. Um, we do know that moons will shepherd rings. Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of the structure in Saturn's rings is from moons that are in there. Some of it is also moons that are further out um, that involve a, a, another resonance dance. Um, but yeah, I'm not super familiar with the details for exactly why um, the system is constructed in this way. Um, but uh, if you do have a situation where you have two moons collide, it is possible that they would create another ring. Um, so this is a situation where you might be in um, this, this state where um, you're repeatedly colliding moons, making rings, and then because you're, a lot of these rings are outside the Roche limit, which is the typical um, inside the Roche limit, you'll have things get pulled apart and you'll make rings, and outside the Roche limit they can stick together. Um, a lot of Uranus's rings are outside the Roche limit, so in principle they could coalesce into a moon. Um, so it is a thought that these rings are perhaps in some, there is some sort of steady state where you're exchanging between rings and moons. Um, but that's pretty speculative at the moment. That would be really cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a, like, I couldn't tell you that that is what's going on, um, but it's a thought. Okay, Neptune. And then I promise I will be around so that you can ask me a whole bunch of questions. Um, <laughs> So Neptune also has um, some inner moons that are um, basically in and among its rings. And to give you a sense of scale, um, this is the Uranian system overlaid. So Neptune in the Uranian system in the inset. Um, so it's a fairly similar scale. Um, but the interesting thing that's going on with Neptune's system is um, not directly really related to these uh, inner moons. It's the fact that there is not a whole bunch else in the Neptunian system except Titan, uh, not Titan. The other one with the R, Triton. Um, so the Neptunian system is pretty empty. Um, there's these inner moons and there's some outer moons and a, a cloud of irregular moons, um, but Triton is the thing that really dominates this system. And it's going backwards. Um, so like most things, you know, the way that the planet is spinning, that's the way that the moons are orbiting, except for the, the um, irregular moons, which are orbiting like in a cloud every which way. Um, but if it's a regular moon, you're orbiting with the planet. So that's a big hint that um, Triton, because it's going the other way, um, so if the, if the planet's going, going this way, Triton's going the other way around. Um, Triton is not a regular moon. Triton did not form around Neptune. It is an interloper. It is an irregular moon. Um, <clears throat> I know, stop, stop your heart. Ask my um, pearls. <laughs> I know. Um, so, so this is um, Triton, um, again, from Voyager 2. Um, it's an interesting moon, a variety of um, surface characteristics. Um, you've got cantaloupe terrain, um, you've also got um, this rougher um, terrain um, closer to the South Pole. Um, Triton has a very tenuous atmosphere, so if you look right at the edge here, you can see a cloud. So uh, Triton's atmosphere is mostly Neptune, and this is a cloud of, um, of basically Neptune, uh, uh, goodness, I am so excited that I am saying things slightly wrong. Um, so um, Triton has, a, has an atmosphere mostly of nitrogen, and so these are nitrogen droplets. This is a nitrogen cloud, um, similarly to how we have water droplets in our, in our um, atmosphere. Um, so that's kind of cool. 
Um, it also has streaks, um, so these dark streaks, um, this is another thing that really tells you that it does have an atmosphere and this atmosphere has wind. Um, we think that these are plumes, possibly cryovolcanoes, which mean volcanoes that operate under really cold temperatures that involve um, water and ice as opposed to rock and lava. Um, but um, these, whatever they are, geysers of some sort or other, um, make these dark, um, make dark plumes and those plumes get windswept um, so that it's not symmetric about the location that the plume originated from. Um, you'll notice that all of these streaks are in pretty, pretty much the right direction, the same direction, which tells you that the wind situation on, on Triton is like reasonably consistent, um, at least when these plumes are active. Um, so yeah, um, so Triton, um, to go back to like really where the drama came from, um, it's going the wrong way. It's an irregular moon. It didn't form uh, around Neptune. So how did Neptune end up with it? Um, we think that um, Triton used to have a friend. Um, so it used to be in a binary, uh, two objects together. Um, when this binary flew by Neptune, there was an exchange of energy and angular momentum and Triton's orbit changed so that it would stay around Neptune and the extra energy and angular momentum flew off um, in its companion. Um, so it would have been something probably pretty similar to Pluto and Charon um, from the Kuiper belt, roughly similar sizes. Um, and it just so happened that one of these um, things similar-ish to Pluto Charon um, wandered by Neptune and one of them ended up captured um, in, in such a geometry that it ends up orbiting Neptune the wrong way um, and its companion flew off with the extra required um, energy and angular momentum. Um, so prior to the New Horizons spacecraft flying by Pluto, um, this was our best um, best picture of a Kuiper Belt object um, because this would have formed probably in a very similar location to Pluto and Pluto has not always been at the orbit that it is now. Um, its orbit got very dramatically changed by a resonance dance of Neptune um, and that's another talk too um, <laughs> which which some of you all have seen um, particularly Hala to the Seashelt Center um, Anyway, um, so yeah, so it's a Triton, um, probably a Kuiper belt object. Um, and it, when it came in, um, because it's um, large and would dominate everything else and like was going the wrong way, um, it pretty much obliterated the rest of Neptune's moon system, except for the inner rings and a couple of uh, the inner moons with the rings and a couple of, the, of other moons a lot farther out. Um, so we don't know what Neptune's original moon system looked like, it's gone. Um, it's gone. Yeah. Um, so there should be an image showing up here that was the same image as on the first slide, but my, let's I hope my computer doesn't freeze. Oh, well, we'll see if the image shows up and if it doesn't, it doesn't. So, um, so moons. Uh, we've talked about Jupiter's moons and Saturn's moons and Uranus's moons and Neptune's moons. Jupiter's got the four large moons. Saturn's got a collection of medium-sized things and also some, um, it's also got Titan um, as its one large moon and it's got some moons in the rings. Um, Uranus has five medium-sized moons and some moons with the rings. Uh, and Neptune has Triton which has obliterated everything else. Um, so these are hugely different. Um, this, is, this is something where I'm going to back up and say, we don't know why Jupiter gets four large moons and Saturn gets a collection of medium-sized ones with one large one. Why doesn't Uranus have a large moon? Um, like, let's just like leave Neptune out of the picture because who knows what its moon system was originally like. Um, but it like it gives you a hint into the sorts of variety that you might expect to see through something like um, like exoplanet systems. 
when we first found hot Jupiters, everybody was shocked. They're like, oh my God, how could a solar system be so different from our own? But if you look at the, the moons of the giant planets, like, I, yeah, we should expect something different than, than what we have. Like the idea that our solar system was somehow typical, like who knows? Um, like, eh. um, yeah, so it's, it's really an interesting case study when we think about questions like, are planetary systems stable? Well, Uranus's moon system isn't. Like, should we expect that planetary systems are? Um, like, what sort of um, variety in terms of, um, of composition might, might we expect? What is that? What, what differences in composition are due to things like tides? And what differences are due to different, like uh, different places in the solar system that the planet form? Um, like when we have a whole bunch of planets that are really close to their star, like Trappist One, um, everybody goes, "Wow, they're really close together." But again, if you look at some of the some of the moons that are very close to the planets with the rings, yeah. Um, cool like we like we didn't know it but we've got other examples of of systems here in our own backyard and let's just like all phone politicians or something and tell them to put a spacecraft around uranus or neptune particularly uranus because it's got more moons um but like eh, uh yeah anyway so moons they're super interesting um and with that I would be delighted to take questions. Thank you so much, Krista. That was super entertaining and really interesting. And I learned a ton from your talk. Um, I, that's, yeah, it absolutely blows my mind. You're right. Let's all call our various representatives and send spacecraft to Uranus, which I know is Phil's favorite planet, which is why he's been secretly clapping his hands in the background. Absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah. Like, um, I think it's just, it's just a crime that we, that we don't have better pictures of some of the Uranian moons. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and from a, like, let's back up and talk about planets perspective, um, a lot of the planets that we're finding around other stars are these things called super Earths, um, yeah. but might be better described as like mini Neptunes or mini Uranuses. Um, and we don't really actually know a whole bunch about the interior structure of Uranus and Neptune. Um, you kind of need a spacecraft around them to, to get a better handle on that. So let's let's do that let's get on it oh, that'd yeah. be great um it's just it abs it's absolutely fascinating to me all this like and it's also such a such an interesting tale of human nature of like we need to categorize everything and then it's like oh nothing fits in our categories hmm no How, yeah <laughs> And it's nice to see it's it's interesting even the categorizing of like regular and irregular moons and it's like that but there's some that cross lines of those two things and some that are like formed in a regular way but are acting irregularly it's, it's super interesting yeah and really the like the different like the regular moons having formed around the planets and the irregular moons having not formed around the planets that presumes you can tell um, yeah that's true yeah and you can't necessarily i mean we thought that hold on i can get it we thought that triton formed around would well we would have originally thought the triton formed around i can get it neptune there we go neptune yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably but um, then it, we learn more yeah yeah it's wild okay so this is a question on that sort of like giant massive questions that i'm not sure we can answer in the next you know 20 minutes but we'll try um can moons have moons yes no kind of um <laughs> Like, okay, so temporarily, sure. Um, and then it, it becomes a, a problem of um, how long would the moon have to have a moon for you to like really count it? Um, so for example, um, Mercury and Venus do not have moons. Um, they're close enough to the sun so that any moon that they would have had would have been stripped um, because the, the solar influence is too strong. Um, moons are in, 
pretty much in a similar regime where between the influence of their host planet and also of the sun, it's a pretty unstable situation. So like, yeah, for a while, um, you could have a moon with a moon, um, but it wouldn't be long lasting. Um, interestingly, so some moons have what an equatorial ridge. So they've got a ridge that goes all around the equator. Um, it is um, unlikely um, that, um, did I just stop, stop sharing my sh screen? Um, I did, yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and so now we look like a conversation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the ideas for how you could in principle form an equatorial ridge um, is if you had a moon with a moon and then that moon, um, like its orbit decayed and you very slowly crashed it into um, its host moon, you could in principle maybe form an equatorial ridge, except, I don't know, the geologists get a little, um, they, they kind of breathe in and, and go, I don't know about that. Um, when, <laughs> when, the, when the space scientists start talking about that, um, it's, yeah, equatorial ridges are, are an interesting thing, um, but yeah. Uh, so maybe <laughs> is probably the best best answer to that question. And that's one of those things I feel like is, you know, we'll sit around, we'll like, we'll, we'll assume that, or we'll find a reason that they can't, and then we'll go off and find some other example of how they can. And it's like, oh, well, there goes that. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, never say die. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Um, there's a, a bunch of questions and I love it. It's great. Um, to what extent are these resonance dances perturbed by the other gas giants? Do the other gas giants pull in them at all? Um, not really. Um, so the other planets would matter more for moons that are farther away. Um, and there is like, there's a, a certain distance past which you don't find moons. Um, so all moons are, are well inside of what's called the hill sphere. And the hill sphere is where you go from the planet's in influence being strongest to the sun's influence being strongest. Right. Um, so all moons are found not just inside the hill sphere, but well inside the hill sphere. Um, and part of that is um, other planets. It is mostly the sun, um, it being much more massive than everything else. Um, and in most cases, a lot closer. Um, mm -hmm. So like, so for example, Jupiter is at um, five astronomical units. So it's five times farther from the sun than Earth is. Saturn's at nine. Ooh, um, yeah. So even when Saturn gets as close to Jupiter as it ever does, it's still a comparable distance from Jupiter as the sun is. Um, so it's, uh, there's a lot of details um, that I'm like, whew, glossing over here and not <laughs> like I don't want to say the other planets don't matter they do they absolutely do um but the the main influence will be the host planet and the secondary influence tends to be the sun okay cool there's a a lot and I'm getting it it's sort of I guess it'd be sort of like saying the gravity of earth matters a lot and ever so slightly the gravity of moon matters to us but like super super tiny um but I have no idea because I am not an orbital mecha mechanist, mechanic. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure either. Orbital dynamicist is oh, the that's typical probably one. Better. Yeah. Um, like, so yeah, um, the topic can be called orbital mechanics or orbital dynamics or celestial mechanics. Okay. Um, so in principle, I could be called a celestial mechanician oh, or a celestial cool. mechanic. Um, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, um, I think funny. I should put it on a business card. Yes, you should. <laughs> um, and that actually answers, I assume, answers Dave Chapman's question, which is what was the subject of your doctoral research? Oh, so that was um, tides and um, exoplanet systems. So um, tides can change the orbits of moons. Um, for planets that are very close to their stars, um, tides can also change the orbits of planets. Um, so I looked at um, if you've got two planets and they're talking to each other with gravity um, and one of them is strongly influenced by tides and has its orbit changing due to that. Um, what is the like 
does making the second planet there make a difference? The answer is yes, a lot. Um, and it's complicated, but that that was basically the, the story of my doctoral thesis. Cool, that's super neat. Perfect. Um, uh, there's, okay, so this is, this is one for the astronomers, the visual astronomer side of you, the observer, observer of you. Um, yeah. How many moons can be seen at nighttime? How many of Jupiter's moons can be seen at nighttime? The so four big ones are really easy to spot. Um, all you need for that is a pair of binoculars. Um, a lot of the big moons were discovered um, right around the advent of the, of the telescope. Um, so a small telescope will give you a dot. Um, like for getting, for getting like actually, you know, you can see a disc things, then hmm, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that takes, that takes a bit more, but um, for, for seeing them as, as points of light, um, you know, pretty easy. Um, mm -hmm. with a with a good pair of binoculars, uh, particularly for Jupiter's moons. They're very large. Apparently tonight, Ganymede's shadow is, is visible crossing the disk of, of Jupiter while the red spot's up. So it's a nice Ooh. You know. yeah. <laughs> Ooh. And I don't have any I don't have any 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 dark. Any nighttime. No. <laughs> as, as, dear astrophotographers, take a picture of this for me, would you? Um, because that sounds really cool. Mm -hmm. There's there's other um there's a couple double transits, like two two um, moons that are going to be passing in front of Jupiter and casting shadows this summer too. Awesome. Um, this okay. So there's a couple of technical questions, which I'm not sure. Like, don't you don't have to spend too too much time on this? Like, do you know the distance from Uranus to the outer edge of its ring? Not off the top of my head. The mm -hmm. diagram was to scale, okay. um, like with Uranus being the right size. Um, so that will give you an idea. And if you want to know the exact number, um, it's available on, on a variety of, of websites. Yeah, sounds good. Um, and then this is one that uh, is harder to, harder to search. Um, you mentioned that two of Saturn's closest large moons, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce this, Tethys, um, and another one, uh, were not involved in the resonance behavior of the other two close moons. Why would that be? Right. Um, so it has to do with frequencies. Um, so I can't actually remember what the ratio is right now off the top of my head. I'm going to make this up. Um, you know what? Let's talk about the Kuiper belt for a second. Okay. My first love. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, you've got Neptune and Pluto, for example. And Pluto goes around the sun twice in the amount of time Neptune takes to go around three times. Um, and there's a whole host of things that are that are doing a similar orbital dance. Further out in the Kuiper Belt, um, there's another population of stuff where um, it like that thing will orbit once in the amount of time Neptune orbits twice. But there's a whole bunch of Kuiper Belt objects in between that, um, and it's just that they don't have the right. Um, orbital period to be near um, an integer ratio. So three to two, two to one, five to four, seven to three. Um, like if you're just, if you're not um, at the right period, you're not at the right period and you don't get involved um, in the dance and you can be in between. Um, there are, that said, there are other resonances going on in the Centurion system and I just didn't talk about them. <laughs> So we call simplifying for the sake of understanding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, how long do you want to be here? Let's <laughs> stay until 10 p.m. Everybody wants to hear that moon's forever, right? <laughs> this is another fact, uh, fact finding one. I just took a quick look um, in case that you didn't have the number on the top of your head, which is what is the total number of moons in our solar system, which constantly changes? Yes, many. <laughs> um, Lots. Yeah. So th like, that's a really complicated question because. So um, a lot of the gains currently being made in um, in like numbers of moons that we know about is with the irregular moons. We found all of the regular ones except the ones that are like very tiny, really. Um, and a lot of those you just you need spacecraft, and there's there's no two ways about it. Um, so um, we've we've found the regular ones, and we're really we're looking for smaller and smaller and smaller irregular moons. Um, it does tell us things 
um, about the planet's history, um, to find more irregular moons. Um, often they come in groups where um, you would have had one original regular moon, uh, irregular moon that then got um, hit by something and broken up. So you end up with a family, um, similar to the asteroid family um, concept, if you're um, at all familiar with that. Um, or you would have, you, you know, you start with something and, and you break it up. Um, so that can help you understand things like what the original irregular moon, um, what sort of size it might've been and all that, um, what sort of conditions it might've broken up under, et cetera. Um, so yeah, there's just, there's lots. Um, it keeps getting to be more. I did a quick Google yeah. and it says over 200 right now, which is pretty big because. Yeah, and you can find them much more easily around Jupiter than you can around Neptune. Um, right. Distance matters because like brightness, uh, pretty big deal. Yep, makes sense. <laughs> and also we don't have any spacecraft out looking around Uranus and Neptune right now, so. <laughs> nope. Right to your. I don't even know. Counselors? Probably not city counselors. I don't think they can do much. No, no, this is totally federal. Um, <laughs> and, and realistically, the Canadian government does not have enough money to, to make one of our own. Um, we can right, try to NASA. talk ESA into doing it or, or maybe yeah. NASA. But like... uh, someday. Um, so that's, I think that's all the questions we have from other people. I have questions, uh, which I won't bug you too long for because it's 822. Um, I know it's only 522 honestly. <laughs> Let's talk about time everybody now. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if so uh, Europa's surface changes a lot and that, that was the one where we saw the pieces broken apart and the squishy the slushy slushy surface. Has it changed at all since we've been imaging it because we've been imaging it just since we sent the one probe out for the most part right? Um, so yes. Um, I'm not sure I could point you to anything specific. Um, one of the one of the things I do like to point to when we talk about the surfaces of of planets uh, or moons changing is um, there's a high there's a camera called High Rise um, on the on MRO which is currently orbiting Mars and um, there you can do things like you can see avalanches, you can see um, these reoccurring slope lineae, which is probably an avalanche related or like landslide related thing. It's probably not actually water. Um, and you can see like fresh impact craters digging up new material and stuff like that. So it's like, it happens all the time. Um, so yeah, Europa's surface is constantly changing. The question of like whether or not I could, or we Find like pictures. astronomers in general could like back and forth, like point to anything specific, um, that would be hard. Um, yeah, cause well, you know, so we had the Galileo spacecraft and um, something was up with its dish. Its dish didn't open all the way or its boom didn't uh, like unfold completely or something like that. So the data rate was terrible, mm. like for normally terrible for spacecraft and it was just so much worse. Um, so we've got a limited data set from from that. Um, we've also, but besides that, um, like Juno's there right now, but it's not really getting close to any of the moons and the cameras were kind of an afterthought anyway. Okay. Um, so not kidding. Somebody basically stopped and went, wait a minute, we're sending a spacecraft to Jupiter and not putting a camera on it. How are they going to get any funding if there's no camera on it? It's a gravitational mission. They're trying to figure out things uh. about the interior structure. Um, so they've got, um, so yeah, it's mostly them probing the gravitational field. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. But then like people see the pretty pictures and then they throw their money at projects. Like I know. And like, yeah. the, like atmospheric science, like in like it's being greatly influenced by these pictures that we're getting back yeah. from Juno, but anyway, but it's not imaging the moons. Um, yeah. the new horizon spacecraft also flew by Jupiter, but didn't got some pictures but not a whole bunch not super high resolution so uh let's send another spacecraft there um like when when clipper arrives assuming it doesn't blow up on the launch pad um well you've mentioned then... it now so obviously you've jinxed it <laughs> yeah anyway uh 
here's me trying not to be a bad luck charm for the mission. Anyway, um, now it's that we have evidence. This is on YouTube for anybody who wants to watch it. I know. Anyway, so. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think when Clipper um, gets there, um, that will be that will be the time that we'll get to start talking about that. Cool. Awesome. I look forward to that. I think it's Sony. It's one of those things that I don't know, for some reason, like you look at the moon and it doesn't, I mean, it does, doesn't do a whole lot. You just look for new craters essentially. And, the, and Mars does some cool stuff, but I guess it's one of those things that's hard to sort of really yeah. wrap your mind around the fact that there's stuff changing that's even further away. Like yeah. so far away, it's like, it's hard to picture things happening out there. It's like the same steady state, but yeah. We yeah. learned that it, it isn't around um, Uranus. Wait, was it Uranus or Neptune? Uranus. 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 Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so there you go. Very cool. I think that covers all the questions that I have and that most of the audience has. Phil, do you have any questions? No, just wanted to say how much I enjoyed the presentation. This was great. Learned a lot. Had some laughs. And uh, we're getting lots of great feedback on the uh, chat uh, that I'm seeing here, in, including a suggestion for a book title for you, which would be Orbital Shenanigans. I suggest that. Yes. You. Yeah. yeah um <laughs> yeah I, it's so true like um whenever a, a lot of the time when i introduce myself to people um i you know i try to be friendly as opposed to intimidating um and when you say i study orbital dynamics um <laughs> then it's like people go oh um <laughs> but if you if you say i study orbital shenanigans they go huh um, and that's a much better opening to a conversation. Um, if you ever like sit next to me on a plane, you'll know that there's a, there's a chance that I'll have a meteorite in my pocket that I'll offer to let you hold. Um, and yes, yeah, so I like, yes, this is what I do on planes to not be bored. So um, you want to trip or something sometime soon? Sure. <laughs> We'll go to Montreal, like there the Montreal go. Center was suggesting. There um, we go. Yeah, we'll stand on top of the mountain. Um, <laughs> Throw in shade. Not, not Bishop Mountain, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so yes, I, I often describe my work as, as orbital shenanigans because it's uh, much more approachable. Um, That's awesome. Thank you for making your talk so approachable today. It was really nice to hear hear about orbital shenanigans in a very approachable and interesting way um and you, awesome. uh, for those of you who are on zoom you couldn't or you i don't think you could see me at least the people on youtube can't see me because i spent the whole time like giggling to myself so <laughs> i could see you <laughs> i know There's... you could i was like i kept trying to like hide my, I'm no, not it's, hide my emotions <laughs> it's great to have the the feedback it's your talk was fantastic thank you so much for for giving it tonight um and we will gladly have you back anytime you want to talk about any other topic that you have any interest in. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks everybody for joining as well. Sorry, I'll let you wrap up. Oh, so like to. Please, Jen. Okay. I, I realized, of course, after the talk started that I forgot to introduce my co-host, Jenna. So <laughs> I should really have introduced you. Either way, we're, we're part of the RASC too, guys. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining. It was so great to see you all here tonight. And our next offering, I think, is Thursday next week. Thursday next week is Explore the Universe. Yeah. So and if then you're... the following week, there'll be another speaker series and the next uh, episode of our Insider's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes. So we've got lots on. And if anyone's interested in joining a center meeting that is not their own or is their own, Ottawa is having one tomorrow night as well. So if you want to join in there, they're going to talk about how to take photos of Aurorae and such. I um, mean, you can find that on our website under Center Events. Uh, and in the COVID activities. Um, we've been active since we've been stuck inside. And we will see you guys next time. Thank you again, Christopher, for joining us. And take care, everybody. Have a good night. So long, everyone. <laughs>